We're going to get through this together. And we are living through historic times. It actually seems like a lot of history is all happening at the same time. We're in the midst of a one in every 100 year worldwide health pandemic, the likes of which uh, most everyone alive has never seen. Uh, we're at a time where we are seeing widespread calls for ending racism, creating true equality, and ensuring justice is available to all. Seeing marches, activity, in many places we have never seen it before, with a lot of our next generation calling for the better world that we were supposed to have created many generations ago. I was listening to one U.S. senator uh, talk this weekend. He says, uh, we have to be courageous in our compassion. And I thought about that a little bit because we've been talking about compassion a lot in Kentucky related to the coronavirus. It's why we have ensured that we have been healthy at home. It's why we've lit up our homes ah. and, and places of business and all types of facilities green, more so uh, in unity and compassion than I think I've ever seen uh, in this state. Well, it's going to take that same type of compassion for our fellow human being, recognizing and understanding uh, that we still have uh, systematic racism in just about every part uh, of our society, and using that same compassion to say it's unacceptable and it's time for it to change. Um, the marches that have been going on uh, in Louisville, um, certainly um, the last uh, several nights, if not more, um, have been very, uh, very peaceful. Uh, because of that, uh, neither the KSP nor the National Guard are stationed in Louisville any longer. Um, the KSP um, ended its engagement uh, in Saturday, and the Guard had only been on standby for a number of days. And while those units are no longer stationed in Louisville, the calls uh, for justice obviously continue, uh, and we need to listen. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about efforts that this administration is going to take uh, to create equality and to start addressing some of the systematic racism that's existed in our health care system, in our law enforcement training, and in our system of public education. I'm going to start with health care. Michael Brown's going to talk about training. And our lieutenant governor is going to talk about education and workforce development. We're then going to go over the numbers. Um, Secretary Freelander is going to talk about long-term care and pandemic EBT. But let me first start with, in our health care system, the inequalities have been laid bare, have been exposed uh, by this COVID-19 epidemic. And, and the results of inequality in health care have been shown. It's death. By allowing this type of inequality to exist for as long as it has, we see African Americans dying at twice the rate that they make up of the population. And it simply can't be allowed to continue any longer, and it shouldn't have taken this type of pandemic, or it shouldn't have taken these types of demonstrations uh, for us to commit to ending it. Now, it's going to take a number of steps, one of, ones of coverage, ones of access, and ones of quality. Well, today, I'm going to make a commitment on coverage. I believe that health care is a basic human right, and I talked even when I was running about how I wanted everybody to have some form of health care coverage. Well, what, as I've been listening and I've been trying to, to hear uh, what those who have been giving voice on in inequality is saying it's time for prioritization in black and African-American communities. So we are going to do that. My commitment today is we are going to begin um, an effort to cover 100% of our individuals in our black and African-American communities. Everybody. We're going to be putting dollars behind it. We're going to have a multifaceted campaign to do it. But it's time, especially during COVID-19, when we see uh, what happens when you don't have coverage, we're going to make sure that everybody does. This is just a first commitment in making up for that inequality that Dr. King said uh, was one of the most severe, and, and that's inequality in health care. 
Again, I want to eventually make sure that uh, there's coverage for everybody out there, but this is the time, uh, this is our commitment, and we're going to make it happen. Uh, next commitment is in the area of law enforcement and law enforcement training. I'm going to ask Michael Brown to address that. Thank you, Governor. Uh, one of the uh, one of the situations created by our response to COVID is that we had to suspend uh, both our cadet classes at our Department of Criminal Justice training, as well as most of our uh, training that's called in service. And Kentucky has one of the highest requirements in the country for officer training, and it served us very well. But we've had to suspend that. And we are now, as we reopen other parts of government and other parts of our economy, we're going to get back to that training. It now provides us with a very distinct opportunity. And if uh, you could put up the slide. While we don't expect that we'll be able to get 40 hours of in-service training for all of our offices this calendar year, we are committed to get at least eight hours of training for all of our office in the remainder of the calendar year. And we are going to focus on some very specific uh, topics and also some very uh, timely topics, some of which are self-explanatory as you look at them. Others are, are not so explanatory, the ones that even I'm going to uh, delve into and actually hope to go through some of the training. Implicit bias, we know that's something that we all have. Use of force, and I don't want to simplify this, because sometimes use of force in the past has been marginalized into more or less a how. And we trained officers on how to do it. Well, we're going to focus a lot more on the when and the why and the what. And that's going to include both deadly and also force to, use of force that can turn deadly. We know about guns, but there are other implements, physical tactics that we need to review. Civil rights laws, uh, if any of you have been through a, a, a course on carrying a concealed weapon, you know part of the focus of that course was to tell you, well, you know, what your responsibilities were. Well, I think this is something that's worthy of refresher course for all of our officers. Ethics, ethics between departments, between governments, between officers themselves, and of course between our, uh, the communities that we serve. Emotional intelligence. I don't know that much about that, so I guess I'm going to take the course along with, with many of our, of our officers. But clearly, all of us come to work and we get up in the morning, if we carry those emotions, those feelings with us, it can affect how we operate during that day. And then, of course, community relationships. With Commissioner GLAC and DOCJT, and along with the Kentucky Law Enforcement Council, we're going to work on adding flesh to these topics and roll this out for the remainder of our calendar year. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Brown will also be providing an update on the David McAtee investigation uh, at tomorrow's 4 o'clock. Uh, we are still awaiting uh, on some information to come back that's necessary to put um, the update uh, that he's going to provide in, in full context. So we've talked about uh, health care, uh, where just the first of many commitments we're going to make is 100% coverage um, in our black and African American uh, communities, and that's going to require reaching out. It's going to require things that look very similar to connectors that we used to have to sign up people uh, all around this state, and it's going to be investing um, in community partners uh, that are already within those communities uh, to help. Uh, no one knows uh, those communities like those foundational partners, and we're going to ensure that they are a big part of that. You heard about law enforcement training, where this will be uh, the most significant set of training. I believe right now, in, in last year's set of training, I wasn't, I wasn't governor last year, well, except for a month, uh, there was only one course that I'm aware of. Uh, it was called Cultural Awareness, and it was only for dispatchers. So this will be a significant step that will apply to 
uh, the, the majority of, of law enforcement throughout this Commonwealth. And next is, is in education, where we still see significant inequality in results and where um, far too many of our schools uh, have educators uh, that look like their students. So I'll ask uh, our Lieutenant Governor and Education and Workforce Development Cabinet Secretary uh, to address that. Thank you, Governor, and good evening, Team Kentucky. Uh, as we have seen over the past two few, uh, few weeks, our society has been crying out for change. As I look out into the crowds um, of people that you see on television and in our communities, I notice that most of them are young people. And as a teacher, I'm proud that we have so many of our young people engaged in the peaceful process and demanding that we as their elected officials enact positive change in their communities. Let me be clear, public education was made to meet this moment. At last week's Kentucky Board of Education meeting, I proposed three immediate changes that I uh, believe will encourage a more complete representation from groups of people often overlooked in the educational process. Uh, the first was to appoint a non-voting member to the board that is a current student. When Governor Bashir added a, an active teacher as an ex-officio member for the first time, it was the first time that that, that has ever happened. And so by adding a current student, uh, to the Board of Education, this ensures that every group in public education has a seat at the table as we talk about the future of public education in Kentucky. The second was to implement statewide implicit bias training for all school faculty and staff. The issue of bias that all of us harbor is something we must confront, especially if that bias hinders our opportunities for our children. Uh, and third, uh, we want to develop new strategies and programs to recruit more persons of color into the field of teaching. For many of our kids, the first leaders outside of their home are their teachers. Kentucky's kids of color deserve to see themselves reflected in their community leaders. And all of our children are better prepared for their future when exposed to a diverse community of leaders and teachers. At the end of uh, the year, test scores are higher for black students who have teachers who look like themselves. Black students who have just one black teacher by third grade are 13% more likely to go to college. And if they have two, then they are 32% more likely to go, to go to college. To do this, we are going to work with our higher education systems, especially Kentucky's historical black colleges and universities like Kentucky State and Simmons College to recruit tomorrow's nation builders. The Kentucky Department of Education has already begun this work, and we will continue to leverage these programs to find a group of diverse young people who aspire to transform their community through teaching. The Go Teach KY program is recruiting the next generation of teachers in the Commonwealth with the mission to ensure that all Kentucky students have equitable access to effective teachers. And the Kentucky Academy for Equity and Teaching is a loan forgiveness program designed to identify and prepare effective, experienced, and diverse public educators from across the Commonwealth. The Bashir Coleman administration has been committed to lifting up the voice of all Kentuckians. The voices of the next generation should be no exception. They deserve leaders who listen, and they deserve leaders who look like them. And today's actions move us closer to that reality. In the coming days and weeks, we will be uh, announcing uh, additional steps, uh, steps that uh, we work with uh, the leaders in these communities to develop. Uh, certainly economic steps and investment are absolutely necessary. One that we're already working on is, is the potential for almost 1,100 jobs uh, with a new MCO that is committed uh, to, to uh, putting their headquarters uh, in, in West Louisville. Now, we have enough time uh, if we can uh, use our workforce development dollars the right way to provide that type of training in that community to try to make sure that as many of those 1,100 new jobs go uh, to people inside the community, that we can start trying to, to build wealth and not just bring outside opportunities uh, in. Uh, this is a historic time. 
It is a historic time in, in the demands that we are seeing uh, for uh, justice and equality. It's a historic time because uh, already with what was happening with COVID, the world was going to be different afterwards, and the United States was going to be different afterwards, and Kentucky was going to be different afterwards. And now, our commitment is to make sure it's not just different uh, from a public health perspective, but it is truly different from an equality and a justice perspective. This is the time where we have the opportunity to be better people, create a better world, and create a better Kentucky. These are just a few steps that we think are going to help us get there. So with that, we'll go into our uh, COVID update uh, for the day. Uh, and you'll see that both Sunday and Monday's numbers are down. Uh, we had seen increased numbers, and, and we believe that, uh, that while our positivity rate is still very low, um, that certainly the extra contacts that people have, maybe getting out for Memorial Day and, and, and other extra contacts, is um, uh, creating more cases. Now, uh, those cases are still in a certain range uh, that, that is manageable, but we will have to be watching um, what happens as that, as that continues. And so we still don't have enough data from the last several days to have a, a full conclusion. Uh, but to give you uh, an idea uh, of just how much testing is out there that these numbers come from, uh, every week since May 11th, we've had over 40,000 tests conducted in that week in the, in the Commonwealth. And that is very significant from where we've, we've come from. Now, the serology versus um, other types of tests is broken down on our website. They are both included in that set of, of numbers. Um, but, but as we uh, sit here this week, I believe last week's positivity rate was about 2.93% um, uh, during the week, uh, which was up from about 2.56% the week before that. So again, uh, a lot of numbers, a lot of things we look at. Um, uh, one set of numbers that we now look at significantly is, is the ICU and the hospitalization rate. So with that, and, and I want to give Sunday and Monday's rates separately, and I know we're trying to, to, to not uh, announce them during the weekend, but sometimes they just get clumped together. They are different days uh, that are reported. So Sunday's uh, report is one of the lowest uh, numbers that we have seen uh, with 70 uh, new cases. And those are 70 cases, uh, 23 of which come from Fayette County, 15 from Jefferson, 12 from Warren, four from Kenton, three from Boone, two from Woodford, and one from Butler, Campbell, Clark, Clay, Franklin, Fulton, Harlan, Laurel, Logan, Muhlenberg, and Ohio uh, counties. Uh, that brought, at least at the end of Sunday, our total number of cases to 11,356. Uh, we also um, had one death uh, on Sunday, and while that is so much lower than what we have been reporting, um, in the last several days, and for that, we're, we're grateful. It is another family, and let's make sure that we don't treat their loss differently than we have treated others. Um, and that loss was a 51-year-old woman from Davis County. Uh, let's ensure that we keep um, her and her family in our thoughts. Uh, Mondays, uh, numbers, today's numbers, are also lower than we've had in, in a little while, with 120 uh, new cases of COVID-19. That brings our total uh, state cases that we're reporting to 11,476. Of those, 264 are probable, and the rest are lab confirmed. Those new cases, 46 from Jefferson. Uh, and when we look back at the numbers, a significant portion of the new cases we're seeing out there are, are Jefferson County. Uh, 25 from Fayette, 5 from Kenton, 4 from Grant, 3 from Allen, Boone, Franklin, Harlan, Ohio, Shelby, and Warren, and 2 from Barron, Bourbon, Davis, Edmondson, Madison, Monroe, Oldham, Campbell, Clay, Logan, Mason, and Scott. And then uh, today, we lost one additional individual, which again is so much lower than, than what we've been seeing. But again, is a loss uh, for that family. Uh, this 66-year-old uh, man from Hardin County. 
So these two individuals that, that we've lost along with those on, on, uh, on Saturday that were announced you know, in, the, in the press uh, release, let's, let's make sure uh, we show them that same compassion uh, for their pain. Let's keep lighting our, our homes and our, our facilities and everything else up green. Uh, let's make sure that we continue to show all of our fellow human beings uh, who are in pain or have been treated unjustly the type of compassion that we have been showing uh, during COVID-19. When we look at the breakdown on race and ethnicity, on overall cases, on race, 72.53% white, 15.68% black or African-American, 6% multiracial, 5.36% Asian. And on ethnicity, it's right at about 85% non-Hispanic and 15% Hispanic. But then there's the, the death piece, which is uh, one of the driving reasons that we had to make the announcement, and we've got to do so much more we did today on, on health care. It, it, inequality here has resulted in death. And it's our job to do something about it. And while there are more long-term steps that we've got to take, we've got to take some action right now. You know, no more waiting. Let's make sure everybody has the means to see a doctor, um, the, the, whether it's, it's Medicaid or, or, or private insurance. Let's make sure everybody is reached and, and can get those options. So on deaths, on ethnicity, it's 96.74% non-Hispanic, 3.26% Hispanic. And then on race, 79.78% white, 16.44% black or African-American, that's double the population percentage, 2% multiracial, 1.78% um, uh, Asian. Uh, now the total number of tests now in Kentucky stands at 285,358. And folks, that's, that's good news. Uh, we are seeing our testing now up close to the top 20 uh, in the country and our trajectory of new tests and, and, um, and staying above that 40,000 uh, is, is, is significant. It is very significant. It means that we can meet the thresholds uh, that people believe we need to to safely reopen, but we can't have testing fatigue. Um, I got a new test just today uh, to make sure that I'm going through those steps uh, that are needed. Uh, to, to show that we cannot uh, have that fatigue and we have to continue to get tested on a semi-regular basis. Our total number of Kentuckians ever hospitalized, 2,368, currently 486. Ever in the ICU, 958, currently 76. This is a number we watch closely. It is fairly low. Uh, that's one where we're going to be uh, concerned if it starts to rise and rise significantly. And our favorite number, the total number recovered, 3,359. Uh, let's look at our long-term care facilities. Again, this is where uh, this virus causes so much death and so much suffering. Um, on Saturday, remember, we lost our third healthcare worker who was in long-term care facility uh, trying to help uh, other people. So we've had since Thursday, this is the update since Thursday. 69 additional residents test positive, 34 staff, seven new deaths, one staff member, six residents. Uh, 11 new facilities have at least one positive. But I will say with the widespread testing that we are doing, um, we are, um, excited is not the, the right word, uh, but we have had a number of facilities come back entirely negative. And right now, many of us would have thought that that, that wouldn't be possible, but our experience with the Green River Correctional Facility shows us that if we can know everybody in a facility and whether they are positive and negative, we can take steps that can stabilize the situation uh, and ultimately protect uh, our people. Um, I'm now going to ask Secretary Freelander uh, to talk about long-term care as well as pandemic EBT. Thank you, Governor. Uh, today I'm here, as I have been here several days, to talk about 
uh, long-term care facilities. You saw from the numbers that the governor presented that uh, this virus really does seem to attack and go for folks who are in long-term care facilities. Uh, the governor mentioned that we had facilities that tested completely negative. Uh, that's 22 percent of the facilities that uh, we have tested have come back completely negative, completely free of the virus. So took aggressive action. And I think, as I've said to you all, I think Kentucky can stand behind the actions that we've taken. The governor was very aggressive in cutting off visitation to long-term care facilities quite early in this process. We uh, started to stand up folks who would go in and our strike teams and we had a long-term care group that came together and advised us very early on standards that we should put in place. At this point in time, we've tested about 30,000 residents and staff. So we think about half of the population of residents and staff we have been able to test at this point. We've tested about 129 facilities in that range. And so we have, uh, we'll, we'll get to at least half before this week is out. We think we've been very aggressive. And rather than just test willy-nilly, we have tested and been strategic about how we test uh, so that we make sure that facilities have a plan because we've seen in a couple of incidences when facilities haven't had plans or when the plans haven't been robust that those facilities have, have real trouble making sure that they maintain the proper number of staff and, and folks have really tried very hard to do that. But we have, we have tried to be uh, uh, targeted. We have tried to have a plan. We wanted to make sure that we were testing aggressively and responsibly. So last week, uh, obviously, we have, we have numbers that, 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 that make our heart hurt around staff, around residents, and around people who have passed who have been in facilities. But last week, we, we were able then to figure out the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, the federal government, all facilities are required to report to them. So for the first time, we've been able to see how we stack up against other states. So this slide demonstrates for you uh, the, some things that we've been able to do. We are in the top 10 of the number of facilities that have been surveyed, and particularly surveyed around infection control. Our resident case rate is almost just half of the national case rate. Uh, so at 62 per, per 100,000, uh, and our case rate, our resident case rate is 33, 34, much less. The death rate again, on the nation, the average is about 27.6. Ours is less than half, 11.8. So again, you look at the numbers that you see for just Kentucky, and, and they do. They, we, want to, we want those numbers to be better. But when you compare them to the nation and the national averages, Kentucky has done a good job, a very good job. And so I want folks who are watching this to know that even though we talk about those rates across the state, if you look at the national level, even if you look at the worldwide level, we have done a very aggressive and good job there. So I, I want that to be of some reassurance to the folks who are watching this. The other piece that I'm here to talk about, again briefly today, um, is what's called the pandemic EBT, or, or how folks can get a replacement for children who would have had meals in schools, those breakfasts and lunches that they would have had. The Kentucky Department of Education has been a fantastic partner. They've put the word out to a lot of the families that they would have otherwise served. They've helped us with uh, our, our IT and data matching, and they have helped us greatly make sure that we've been able to provide outreach to these families. So just, just within less than a week, we have now been able to extend benefits to those folks who, who didn't have any other connection to the cabinet, an additional 65,000 households, and another 99,000 children who would be impacted. So we know already that we've put out about 143 million in benefits. Um, 
the folks who have been getting assistance through DCBS, we think we've reached almost 400,000 kids, about 360,000 kids. You can still sign up. You can sign up through the end of June. Please do so. It is fairly easy. There's the Benefind website. And then you can call. Uh, if for those who don't, do not speak English can apply at the, the number that's up on the, on the screen. So it's go to the PEBT fact page, look for DCBS COVID. There's some place you can email if you have questions. We've answered 2,000 so far. And this is the main number that you can call to apply for benefits. Please do so. These benefits, I know folks sometimes feel like, well, I, I maybe don't need these benefits. These benefits not only help you, they help your community, they help your local grocer. Please sign up. We're ready and waiting for you to do so. Thank you. All right. Uh, at this point, we will open it up for questions. We have one, two, three, four, um, five journalists with us here today and a group of questions from home. I'll try to do one and, and, and one as we move through. Lawrence, you want to kick us off? Well, the, the first goal that we have is to have 100% coverage, every single individual in our African-American uh, communities to have a form of health care coverage. That could be Medicaid, uh, that could be private insurance if they qualify for Medicare uh, but aren't otherwise signed up for it, but every single individual uh, to be able to have um, that type of coverage. Now, there are still other issues that we got to deal with. we got to deal with access. You shouldn't have to take multiple buses to see. Uh, a doctor. We'll have quality issues that we have to address. We'll have um, uh, other type of, of, of societal or other issues that can lead uh, to poor health. But the thing that we can do, um, maybe not immediately, but start on right this minute that doesn't require a task force or anything else, is a direct effort by this administration uh, to get everybody signed up for some form of coverage. And uh, the blueprints are out there on how to do it. Um, when we, when we, uh, when, when we, when uh, a past administration uh, launched Connect, uh, you saw a, a statewide effort, and this is going to be more targeted, uh, to try to sign up uh, as many people as possible, and, and we were the most successful uh, in the country. There are multiple um, uh, groups out there that have done this at different times, and here we have more interconnection, I believe, in the community we're looking to sign up um, than, than in many other places. Uh, so our, we're going to put money into it. We're going to put people into it. We're going to make sure that the community anchors uh, are a big part of it. But, but it's time. Every individual uh, is our goal. And I'm not going to be happy with 99.5. We're going to have to go and find um, those extra individuals. And, and we saw some of that fall off in the last four years statewide. Less children signed up for KCHIP, which is the, the children's version of Medicaid. Uh, we're going to reverse that, but it's time for the priority in this community that, that um, I've been hearing has not been there. Uh, let me answer one from here, uh, asking me about the outbreak among members of the Clays Mill Baptist Church following my recommendation to avoid these types of gatherings. First, uh, I hope that everybody that, that tested positive from services at Clays Mills Baptist Church um, has seen or talked to a doctor uh, get the health care uh, that you need. We want all of you uh, to be uh, okay. Um, I think this situation, along with some others, there was one in, in Western Kentucky, uh, and along with the Supreme Court decision that's backed up um, uh, our authority to do it, um, I hope just proves to everybody that the reason that we ask people to shut down uh, in-person services at a time when, when COVID was increasing, almost doubling, every week was about protecting human life. You know, I'm a person of faith. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a guy who goes to church when we could every single weekend and my kids are going on, on Wednesday nights. It was absolutely never about, nor would it ever be about, trying to get in, in the way of people uh, going to their, to their house of worship. But what it was about is making sure that people aren't harmed when they're going to their house uh, of worship. 
And I know that the pastor of this church is, is the one that stepped out on the front of uh, the Capitol with the Attorney General and said, um, stop it, Governor, we can, we can do this safely. Well, he couldn't. So let's just make sure um, that um, when any facility, not just a house of worship, is opened, that we are truly ready and that we take the guidance seriously. Uh, that if you were having a bunch of people come in um, to an inside space, you ought to be asking them to wear masks and you ought to be leading uh, with it. You got to make sure that you have the cleaning, that people are spaced out, that you don't just give lip service to these guidelines, but you put your leadership behind it. You put your credibility behind it. Let's just make sure that these situations don't happen um, again. We all uh, want to be safe, especially um, in, our, in our houses of worship. Tom? Thank you, there's a local restaurant tour here who uh, wants to know when the 33% limit will be raised. Uh, so can't the thing you can stand it isn't very long uh, being able to serve more people. Uh, the question is on restaurants and the 33% limit. Um, uh, our original uh, goal was to look at potentially raising that one month uh, from the original opening, and we're still watching the numbers. If we don't see a spike, that's likely the time that, that we will do it. Now, the time when you can have uh, 50 or under um, is also going to provide a, a new option for folks um, to where as long as you have the space uh, in the restaurant, it can spread people out. Once we have the 50 and, and under guidelines, it's going gonna, it's gonna to simplify a, a number of things. I know our restaurants are really trying, and all I'd say is to any restaurant that's not doing everything that you should be doing, you're putting every restaurant in their capacity uh, at risk. But I've, I've been really impressed uh, with how hard they're trying, with the exception of a bar or two uh, that wasn't doing the right thing. It's, 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 it's been really, really neat to see how much they care uh, about their customers. Uh, that goes into effect either the 28th or the 29th. 29th. Um, Catherine, let me read one more. Uh, have I been made aware of the sexual assault harassment allegations being made against LMPD Detective Brent Hankison on social media? Um, I've just been informed uh, about some of those. Any uh, allegation of, of sexual harassment uh, or sexual assault, uh, it's important to take it seriously. Uh, we live in a world with a rape culture uh, where nearly one in every two Kentucky women face some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. Unacceptable. And part of the better world we're trying to build ought to be a world where people don't face uh, that type of, of violence in their life. So um, if any um, of those um, individuals, I would think, want to speak either um, to um, certain detectives in um, uh, LMPD, in the Kentucky State Police, or investigators in the Attorney General's office. I know when I was there, we did it. Certainly, um, any of those law enforcement officers should listen and should take it uh, very seriously. Uh, we, we've, we've, we need a better world in, in, in so many ways, and why not now? Catherine. No. The question is, is an eight-hour course on um, implicit bias and, and, and racism and the rest for law enforcement enough? The answer is, is, is no. Um, but it is a start. And it's a start that we can actually accomplish. Uh, so when we looked at what we can do and do immediately, I wanted to make sure there were things um, that we could get out there and get done. Uh, and obviously, we're going to have longer-term announcements that come up. Um, is, is, that, is an eight-hour course enough to solve every issue we see out there? No, it's not, but it's a start. And we can have other programs that build upon it, um, but it's a start in changing um, uh, culture for all of us. I, I want to say that this is not just a law enforcement issue. Uh, implicit bias and, and, and racism uh, permeate every part of our economy. You heard about it in education, certainly in, in health care. In many ways, we're all going to have to figure out what our training is, uh, how we do better uh, moving forward. Kentucky cases are up about 25% over the last two weeks. The seven-day rolling average of positives is also increasing, uh, so it doesn't appear to be just an increase in testing. Do I still feel comfortable with the reopening strategy? Uh, I do. 
but we are very carefully monitoring this. I mean, we just had numbers today uh, that are down. When you look at the weekly um, positivity rate, uh, it's gone up about a percent over the last three weeks from 2.07 to 2.93 percent. Now, we are down from a 9.77 percent positivity rate the 4th of May. Uh, so we just want to put it all in context, but we're watching this every day. Uh, remember when we, when we had a two-week decline, and we want to get back there, uh, it took us almost a week uh, after that to, to truly see it. So uh, we're going to see more positives. We're going to. We're going to see more positives because people are having more contacts. Now, I do worry um, that, um, that, 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 that some aren't taking it as, as seriously um, as, as we should. Um, I know we put out some uh, guidance, initial guidance for review uh, on education and opening schools. Uh, and, and I know at least in a couple situations, if we had 10 things, somebody said, well, we can't realistically do half of those. And just tell us it's still safe. Well, it's not. And we can, this is, this is a virus that we know certain things about. And we know that distance and masking work. And if people are unwilling to do those things, it makes it less safe. So the more people out there that wear masks, the safer we are. The more people that engage in social distancing, the safer we are. Uh, the more people that have decided that they're over it, um, that makes it harder. And separately, let me say um, that, that um, if you've been in a large group in the, in the recent past, uh, get tested for your safety and for others. Joe. So the attorney for David Maxwell's family asked today that all parts of the investigation Well, yeah, so it's an ongoing investigation. I believe we are sharing more pieces of it uh, more quickly than uh, just about ever occurs uh, in it. What I do want to make sure is as um, uh, evidence is shared with the public that it's in context. In other words, um, uh, if, if there are multiple videos, people ought to be able to see them all uh, together. Uh, so I want to make sure that, that yes, we are going to be providing uh, evidence as we go. Uh, but if there is a piece that somebody hasn't followed up on, it may be important to present it together. Like there are multiple forms of ballistic evidence uh, in, in this uh, case. Um, that all that ballistic evidence is needed uh, to be presented together to know what you're looking at. Um, but our, our plan is to share uh, details as we go forward. Uh, let's see. As Confederate monuments come down, both around Kentucky and around the country, I'm wondering what is uh, my take on the Confederate memorial uh, in front of Callaway County Courthouse in Murray and whether I'd consider taking executive action. I will admit that I've been uh, focused on the Jefferson Davis statue, which I believe needs to come down uh, in, in the rotunda of, of this Capitol. I believe it is a symbol that divides us and uh, I'm it no longer, and to me it never, had a place in, in a rotunda that is supposed to, to honor people, not to show history, um, but to honor them. And I don't believe that another child should have to come into this Capitol and look up at a statue of, of someone that is rightfully seen as supporting the enslavement of some of our citizens. It shouldn't be there. And I'm not just talking about um, uh, removing it. Um, we're working on, on taking steps to actually get it done. Um, I'm not um, familiar or familiar enough with this uh, monument in Murray, but if it is at a courthouse, it ought to come down. That's simple. And you know what? You're seeing people march all over Kentucky uh, that agree. And I know that might cause some, some disagreement for some people out there, but I told you, a while ago that I'm past politics, I'm trying to do the right thing and having a Confederate memorial, a Confederate monument um, on, on, on courthouse grounds or in the rotunda is not the right thing. Should have done it long ago, but let's, let's get rid of them now. Al. It looks like the World Health Organization uh, undermined the best argument for mass wearing today when it said that asymptomatic transmission was very rare. Um, do you all have any reaction to that? Any uh, altered guidance? 
Uh, the, the question is about new, new information from the World Health Organization. I haven't read it yet, um, but uh, I certainly know that all of our state public health officials and every federal official, I was on the phone call today with the Vice President and Dr. Burks, um, every single time uh, are, are, are saying, uh, wear a mask and it protects people around you. So that'll be something we'll have to look at and analyze, um, but certainly from the way that we believe this spreads, coughing. Even asymptomatic folks coughing should be able to spread this. Um, there's no question a mask will serve as a barrier to reduce this, that. And if we find out uh, that masks aren't helpful, I don't want to ask people to wear a mask just to wear a mask. No, nobody does. But as long as I still believe this might prevent me from spreading it to somebody else whose body might not be able to handle this disease, I'm going to wear it. And even if it's in part based on faith, uh, and, and, and being my brother and sister's keeper or uh, faith that I know that this could at least reduce it some, it's worth it to me. Um, is it Nick? Come back there. Nope. All right, back to Lawrence. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Gentlemen, the, the guidance for uh, historical racing venues has not yet been posted. Why not? And when will that guidance be up if they're already open? Well, that should be that should be posted. Um, it's based on a proposal that they sent to us that we okayed. Uh, so we'll need to, to to post that. If you want to serve an open records request, we can get uh, what that proposal is uh, right to you. That's that's a public document. Tom. The majority of members of Louisville National Council sent you a letter today, in which they're going to ask you to ask the Kentucky Department of Education to take another look at the requirements for opening up. They, they fear, among other things, that at JCPS, for example, having to deal with three different scenarios is really going to squander some scarce resources. Uh, well, our, our request for people to develop three different plans was because we don't know what the virus is going to do, and you know, I was always taught to be prepared. That doesn't mean that you have to, to put tens of thousands of dollars into developing the plans. It just means you need to be thoughtful. Uh, about how you're going to do it. I mean, I think it's worth spending that intellectual capital and that time if it, if it better protects uh, our children. Um, you know, I'm, I, we, we have got to be willing um, within our schools, if we're going to open them the way that I want to, I want our kids back in school in the fall. But if we're going to do that, we have to recognize there's a pandemic out there and we're going to have to do some things differently. And if we fight every difference, that there would be in our classrooms, and we're just ignoring the pandemic. And I would like to think in, in, in uh, bastions of education, we would learn from the past, we would listen to the science, we would adopt the public health, and yes, if it means that people have to do things that are somewhat uncomfortable, if we have to move desks further out, if we have to change busing schedules, if that's what it takes to make it safe, and we should consider it. Now, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to each superintendent. Each superintendent closed down schools. They'll have the opportunity to open them. And what we're going to do is we're going to put out, here is the, the way to make it as safe as you can. It's a worldwide health pandemic, so as safe as you can. And then superintendents will have to decide which of them they're willing to do uh, or not. That's not trying to push it uh, back on them. They're the ultimate decision makers there. But what I'm not going to do is to say, um, if you won't do multiple things, you're still just as safe. No, we, there's no question that we can give you the, the steps that under our current knowledge will make it the safest. And we hope you'll take as many of them as you can and, and put them into practice. I'll, I want to get you those numbers uh, directly um, because I, I, the, the uninsured rate, I know we have those numbers in our African-American um, community. Uh, and then there's also uh, which communities around the state um, and, and the size of those. Um, but we'll get you that number. I want to make sure that it's accurate. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's uh, higher, uh, I believe, than just about any other demographic, but we're going to fix that. I have any questions. Um, are the ballistic, ballistic tests back on um, both the hip and the back the And two, why have uh, no National Guardsmen who fired shots been named like the LMP officers? So the question on naming the, the National Guardsmen is with the, the JAG, uh, the Judge Advocate General. 
um, because there are some, some different laws that come into play. We're awaiting uh, their response uh, to uh, whether and, and how we provide uh, those names. Um, uh, the ballistics, you know, there are multiple pieces of ballistic uh, evidence. We believe that we will have them all uh, to present tomorrow, and that'll put all of them in context. Al? Today, the uh, percent of contacts traced fell from 45 percent to 22 percent, which is not very good. Are those figures accurate? And if so, what's the problem? Yeah, the, the figures on COVID Act now in relation to contact tracing. Uh, at one point, they had us with 50 contact tracers, and we had uh, a lot more than that. Um, we'll, we'll give an update on the hiring. What I know we have in place is we have um, uh, the hiring um, significantly done for the Department of Public Health. We have the regional folks, which was that second level, um, just about fully hired, and now they're onboarding um, the, the, the additional contact tracers uh, throughout the state. Um, I believe that we're better than, than, than what COVID Act now is saying. Now, are we where we need to be? No, we're not. We still have a lot of work to do there. Um, I was a little worried that a number of members of the General Assembly just said they didn't think it worked at all. Well, the White House says we have to do it. Uh, and um, I believe that, that we can. Uh, I believe there, there will be some instances where it's easier than others. Uh, certainly um, the, the tracing, say, through the Clay's Mill incident, um, you certainly can, can determine who else uh, was at that meeting and then, and then trace those individuals. Sure. Uh, sure. Afraid you want to hear complaints from their constituents about contact tracing? Uh, I don't know exactly what's driving the, the legislators that, uh, that, that voice those issues. Um, all I know is that we have uh, the White House, we have federal health experts, um, you have the governor's office, you have state health experts that all say that we've got to do contact tracing. Every single governor um, across the, the country uh, is doing it now. Uh, so I don't know why we'd, why we'd uh, throw criticism out there from something that, that you know, on all levels uh, we say we need, and, and it's been done in the past. Never it's something like this, um, but it's, it's, it's not new. Uh, and, and it's something that we just have to replicate at a much larger scale than, than has ever happened, admittedly. Let's try to go through one more time. Talk about the efforts again to flush things out, including teachers of color. What is the percentage now of African American teachers and where do you want to get? Uh, let us get you those, those numbers. The, the, the percentage of African American teachers in the Commonwealth is, is far lower than, than, than the population and way too low um, in all of our school systems. And it's incredibly important that our students, uh, especially our students of color, have uh, teachers uh, that look like them and, and share some of their experiences. And, and the numbers on attainment, and I'll say that we need to be making major investments in, in this, and it, and it could be uh, transformational, but this is everywhere. It's in our state government. We'll be providing a report in the future on that where I believe we are doing much better, but we have um, a long way to, uh, to go. Uh, it's in um, so many of our contractors of, of different types across the state that we do business with, and we got to do better uh, there, making sure more uh, dollars are going to minority contractors. And when you get points on bidding on a contract uh, for a minority contractor, that they're actually a part of the project and not just uh, being listed. So. You know, it's time, and I'm committed. Uh, my administration is going to do everything we reasonably can to, to try to create the better world that's being demanded out there. Tom. Governor, Congressman uh, Homer said today on uh, a radio station in this district that uh, Kentucky needs to open up businesses entirely immediately because there are businesses not in his area are getting killed by Tennessee. And, um, if Congressman Comer um, thinks opening all businesses right now is a good idea. I think public health disagrees. Um, his real fight there is with Donald Trump, uh, whose administration put out a plan uh, that uh, with where Kentucky is right now would not approve of that. Uh, so if he'd like to argue with Dr. Burks or Dr. Fauci uh, or the White House itself, he can feel free. Catherine. Well, I don't, I don't worry too much when the opposing political party, the organization itself, attacks me. That's their job. 
that's what they do. Now on Friday, um, we had 1,500 young people march in Frankfurt. I think that'd make it one of the 15 largest marches that we've ever seen here. Out there, um, demanding change and demanding a better world. Uh, and even with the, the health concerns, I thought this moment in time, uh, it was important to be there. And for those individuals, it was important to, 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 to talk to them. It was, um, it was pretty incredible uh, to see uh, a whole generation uh, demanding something better, uh, but also, as I saw and, and, and when I went out, having some faith that maybe I can be just a small part uh, of, of doing it. Uh, now, everybody who's in one of these marches, please go get tested. It's, it's a smart thing to do, um, and, and we want to keep you healthy. But there are some moments in time where even though it was a, a personal safety issue, you know, when you look at, at health care, it's, it's, it's important to be there. That's what I wanted to do. Oh, we are not at this point, and, and we haven't seen what the plan would be and how many uh, there would be. Um, I, I, Churchill hasn't gotten back with us on on that on that specific one yet. I know they're working on uh, some some other pieces uh, as they're moving forward. All right, Al, take us home. Uh, regarding the uh, possible reasons for the uptick of uh, the last week or ten days that uh, could have been related to Memorial Day, but really there wasn't that much incubation time. Isn't perhaps Mother's Day and the beginning of churches and the beginning of reopening May 10th and 11th likely the uh, starting point for what's been showed up in the numbers uh, last week? I don't think there's there's any question that that the more we open up and every time we've opened up. We're going to see some more cases, uh, and and you know we, we've we've prepared for that. And one of the reasons that we we had to flatten the curve is so that we have the healthcare capacity uh, to help people as this virus moves through uh, our population. But yes, every time we open something up, it creates the opportunity uh, for the virus to to spread. And and where we're at right now, looking at just our overall number of cases, probably um, isn't the most important analysis. It's it's. Uh, whether uh, when people get it, how sick are they getting? Are we providing them the treatment? Do we have the ICU capacity? You know, we're at that point where we've got to restart our economy, which means we've got to take care of people. And when that ICU number, if it does significantly go up, then, then we're really going to have to, that's when we really have to look at things. As a follow-up, have you essentially decided that we're going to have to live with a certain number of cases day by day uh, for the uh, foreseeable future? Well, until we have a vaccine, it, the, the, the virus is going to spread at least a certain amount. You know, even when we were healthy at home uh, and limiting our contacts, we still had 100 uh, something cases about what we have uh, today. Um, I think it'll be really hard for us to get under that number um, in the near future. And as long as we are taking care of people, as long as we are protecting our long term care facilities, which we really need to, as long as we're ensuring there's not an outbreak like there was at Green River, which is stabilized, and we are um, happy about that, and, and Western State, which is stabilized, uh, then we got an opportunity to, to reopen uh, our economy while dealing with this virus. The, the virus doesn't go away, so there are going to be cases that, that spread uh, throughout us. Let's make sure we know the signs, we're willing to quarantine when we have to, and we go see a doctor when we need to. And separately, Dr. Stack made sure to remind me, if you have been putting off necessary medical procedures or checkups. We need you to be healthy. If, you're, if you put off your kids' vaccinations, now is the time to go back and, and, and get them. Let's make sure that as we come out of this, we do the things to be healthy enough to deal with this virus if we potentially get it and that we don't succumb to, to other issues. All right, folks, it is um, the end of the day. And again, I, I know I've, it, it's it strikes me that we are at a, a moment in history that can change things in so many different ways. And I think if we open our, our hearts, we open our, our minds, we, we accept that, that we have a world that has had real problems in it. And then we use, whether it's our faith or our compassion, to say that it is time that we address them, uh, that there is a lot that we can do uh, together. Um, 1,500 young people here right behind the Capitol, just telling us all, all of us, that they want a better world. You know, I think that we all live for our kids. We all live for that next generation. 
So let's fulfill our commitment. Let's satisfy those demands, and let's give them the world that they deserve. Thank you all very much. Oh, sorry, we got a video to leave you with. Um, as you know, we've got a return in July of NASCAR here in the Commonwealth up at the Kentucky Speedway. It is the 10th anniversary of it, so they sent a message to, to, to leave us with. NASCAR is pleased and excited to announce the 2020 schedule for the annual July weekend at Kentucky Speedway. The weekend commences with the NASCAR Xfinity Series, Kentucky 200. That's Thursday, July 9th on Fox Sports 1. Friday, July 10th features the Xfinity Series, Alsco 300, also on Fox Sports 1. The NASCAR Gander RV and Outdoor Truck Series, buckle up in your truck 225, Saturday the 11th on Fox Sports 1. And the highlight of the weekend, the 10th edition of the NASCAR Cup Series, Quaker State 400, presented by Walmart, Sunday, July 12th on Fox Sports 1. NASCAR and Kentucky Speedway, a bluegrass tradition.